All right. It says we're online. Hopefully my internet will not drop out. Um, so what I'm going to end up doing is people that are watching this on YouTube will see the kind of unfiltered, unedited version, and then when I do the download and make it into the little MP3 file, we'll clean it up, and I'll put a front end and a back end to this thing. But um, So anyway, with me uh, this uh, evening is my good friend and old scouting buddy um, who, you know, when I, was, I used to be a jerk to them all, but then I grew up and realized not to be a jerk anymore. But he took it well. And he is now a fine, he's a fine young man, because, well, relative speaking, we're all getting old. Um, we're all old people. We're all old people now. We're getting, it's like, <laughs> it's sad. It really is. But, uh, so his name is uh, Mike as well, Mike Seeley. He is a uh, professor, right? Professorial? That's, yeah, that's what, that's what they call us down here Prof- sometimes. Professor uh, at Full Sail University, which, so you kind of give you a little background too. I was aware of Full Sail thanks to what was the name of uh, uh, the Film Riot podcast or video cast or YouTube channel or whatever it is that they are. Not familiar with that one. So uh, I guess the guy, his name was Ryan Conley. He went, I think he went there back in, what, how long have you guys been around? Uh, Full Sail I think just celebrated like their 36th anniversary. Whoa, um, I didn't know that. We haven't been at university for a very long time. I think we started as a university in 2008. Uh, they started out as a recording workshop up in Chicago, and then, in, like, in the back of a bus, moved down to Florida, set up as a recording associates, a recording arts associates program, and then expanded into other media entertainment industries. And now we are, I think we offer something like 36 undergrad degrees and, I think, eight master's programs. So, an ever-expanding, so... Yeah, because I looked at the website before, like, you tr- you're trying to be semi-serious about doing this <laughs> podcasting, and I was like, and the last time I had looked at it probably was when I came down to visit you guys, like, two, was it two years ago now? Almost two years? Oh, wow, yeah, it's probably been a, about a year and a half, yeah, something like that. And time flies when you're getting old. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you really did, though, right? You moved down. Yeah, I, I moved down here, I actually went to school at Full Sail, um, I started school back here in 2007. We were actually called Full Sail Real World Education uh, right before they became a university. Um, I actually heard about the school. You said you heard about it through somebody else's uh, podcast or a YouTube channel. Um, I originally heard about the school because I wanted to make video games, and I was reading through different game companies, and Square Enix was the big one that I wanted to work for, and they actually recommended to either go to DigiPen out in California or Full Sail University, or Full Sail Real World Education down here in Florida, so this one was a lot closer, so I came down to Full Sail, and I don't regret it. It's been awesome. When, so, uh, I'm trying to remember, like, I left the Glen Burnet area in 1999. <laughs> That's you were, Merchant Marines, right? Yes, uh, you raw Merchant Marine. That, <laughs> that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I liked being out at sea. I didn't like being out at sea for like 13 months at a time. Well, yeah, I can but see I, that. Yeah, that was see you know, that was that was the killer for me. Like, you're always out at sea. So I went to the navy, and we were at sea less. <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense. The <laughs> navy, the people who are always on the water. Yeah, you know, moving goods actually takes more work than blowing bad guys up. Go figure. That's impressive. You know, I think about when. When really has the last time? Like World War Two was the real last big navy to navy battles. We don't well, navy, nah. Yeah, probably the last big navy to navy battles. But I mean, there's lots of they do patrols and drills all the time, and you know, shows of force out in that's right, really, like around the Mediterranean. I think in the, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, and we we got our Gulf friends area. with the Libyans. Yeah, they're all yeah. all those nice guys. All those other places you hear about on the news. Yep. But anyway, <laughs> this is not about the Navy or me. This is about you and Full Sail University. So let's go back. So you graduated. Well, you would have been in high school, what, 2002? Five. I'm five. five. You're really that much younger. God damn. Yeah, I'm that much younger. So. so 2005, graduate. You want to go work, you have your dream to work for a video game company, you're, 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 you're researching your stuff, you're, you're figuring out, um, you figure out you want to go to Full Sail, how did that actually happen? Uh, so I kind of knew that I wanted to make video games just because, I mean, everybody 
like everybody has like that one career that they dream of like as a kid and for me I played video games all the time so it was like oh I really want to make video games so um, in high school I started taking like some just basic programming classes like I still did like COBOL and Fortran because apparently that was still a thing at the time um, I finally did like some visual basic stuff um, and then when I hit my junior year uh, for the first time at my school, which was Chesapeake High School up in Pasadena, um, they just started offering an AP computer science class for the very first year. So I jumped in on that. I took the A class in my 11th grade year and the AB class in my 12th grade year. And programming just seemed like lots of fun. So uh, I knew I wanted to go to Full Sail because, um, I was, like I said, I was reading around on different game companies' websites and saw that the one that I wanted to work for recommended this school, so I went ahead and came. I wanted to come to this school, but uh, I wanted to make sure that it was still something I'd enjoy after a couple years, so I didn't want to just rush into it. I'm, I've always been an old man who considers everything first, so uh, I actually went to uh, the community college up at Anne Arundel Community College for two years. Took um, I took an assembly programming class because that was part of the associates program there, uh, which I never finished. I went ahead and just skipped the associates and went right to my, my bachelor's degree. But I took the assembly class, and I took another Java class. Um, I took a C++ class just to see if programming was still something that I'd enjoy. And uh, after liking it for two years, I figured, what the hell, and it came on down. So either I'm crazy or I love this stuff. Either, I, either I'm crazy or it's actually fun. So I hear you. Still not entirely decided. It, it could be just, I'm just crazy. So. Yeah, but you're st like that, it's still relatively young. So the stuff that you did up at Anne Arundel Community College, did that transfer down, or were you starting from um, scratch, sort of? Some of it, like the uh, the, uh, the concepts and the ideas and uh, the things that I've learned, the knowledge transfer down. Credits didn't just because um, most of our programs here are really focused and specialized on the one thing that you want to do. So while I had taken programming classes before and learned some programming, it was more of this is programming that we use in games. This is the type of programming we do, and then everything's focused towards what you're doing. Like the very first class I was in, I was actually just telling somebody about this other game. Like the other day, uh, the first class we take is programming one. It's a simple programming basics course, but you still make like console-based games in the class. So everything's focused towards how do I make this? How do I do programming and do it towards games? So. Uh, so the knowledge transferred, you know, some of the concepts, but not credits exactly. So, so that's and you hit on a point that because I I also did this a couple of months back with Scott. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he went the professional electrician route and he went through the schooling through the, the the unions and whatnot, and compared that, contrast that to someone like me who went to the quote unquote traditional college system, right? And one thing that always frustrated me was how many classes I had to take that had nothing to do with my degree. Oh, yeah. That's... With the theory that we're going to make you more well-rounded, right? So it's like, yeah. yeah, I'm an engineering major, but go take a music class and take... And I, I appreciate the idea of becoming more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that me having to pay... Would, you know, Because basically, that comes out to a good... It's so about fifteen hundred dollars a class sometimes. Right, and so over the course of you know having to take like two humanities, two arts classes. I mean, I pretty much am in school for an extra semester and a half, mm -hmm. more than I would have. And I think in this day and age, there's so much other opportunity to get well-rounded that mm -hmm. college, university, in the traditional sense. You know, to me, it just seems like now we're just basically you know milking people for an extra couple thousand dollars of tuition. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of public education, a lot of public universities are hurting for money, so a lot of those gen ed classes that are required that people will go in and take, uh, they make a ton of money off of those, those kind of classes. Like like I said, I was going for an associate's degree. I mean, I never finished it, but I still went ahead and took the classes that were required, so I took um, a couple of ja Japanese language classes because I was interested in Japanese language and I figured, all right, I need a fine arts credit, so I do this. Uh, I took a classical guitar class that uh, I, re I don't remember anything except for how to play green sleeves out of that class. Uh, I couldn't t read the music or anything. I can play green sleeves like the first, uh, up until the first repeat, and then that's it. That's all I remember from those classes. I, re I remember paying a lot of money for them, but uh, that was about it. I mean, so it sounds like full sale to me. 
you guys, the thought down there is to be much more practical, hands-on, and and I think does that translate to the means you're you're from the day you start to the day you got in your first job? Is it is it it's it four years like a traditional undergrad, or can you do it in a shorter period of time? So we do things a little bit differently down here. Well, actually, we do things a lot differently. Uh, so instead of the traditional semester-based classes where you're in the same class for like one or two days a week for three months or whatever it is. Um, our students go to school on campus uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, and they do one to two classes a month. So whereas you normally do a four credit class in three months, we do a four credit class in one month. Um, and then you just go to school year round. We don't do like summer breaks and winter breaks. So I think we have two weeks in the winter for the holidays and one week in the summertime around 4th of July, but otherwise we go to school 12 months out of the year, uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, and you end up graduating in 21 months. So, 21 months? 21 months. We might do things in months around here, not really semesters. So. Sweet. See, I think, I think you guys have a, I don't know what you call it, a, a, a framework, a, a mindset, a something about education that to me, I think the rest of education needs to catch up on. Yeah, we, we take the approach of we're kind of met, trying to mirror the industries. So like most of the industries that you're in, you are you don't take three months out of the year off just because it's the summertime. And you still go to work during the summertime. Uh, so we take the approach of you immerse yourself in whatever it is that you want to do for your career. And then as long as you... if because like, try to learn a new language. The best way to learn a new language after learning a couple conversational phrases is to usually go and immerse yourself in the language, go visit the country, uh, stay for a few weeks or a month, and right. actually speak with native speakers. So the way we take it here is you immerse yourself in it, and you go to school year-round, and you go on the same schedule that you would if you were in the industry, and you're hands-on all the time. So figure if you have that more immersive approach, you have more hands-on, it's more practical when you get out the industry that you can jump right in as if you were doing it for two years because you kind of have been doing it for two years. See, that's, oh, I, we have an issue where, like, in my day job world, um, finding engineers and scientists, right? Mm -hmm. um, A, it's hard enough as is just because those majors aren't being produced at the rate that we need. But even, and I'll admit, you know, even when I came out of college, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever years ago now. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I had a very good theoretical understanding of things. I had some practical knowledge, but there is a huge divide, you know, in the electrical computer engineering world from what I learned as an undergraduate to what was actually needed out in industry, government, military. That world was like, it was so far between because our issue was, and I think my school's gotten better since then, we didn't have a good, really good connection to private industry. Um, and a lot of people that were teaching there got their PhDs in the like, you know, 1960-something, 1970s, before there was even personal computers. And now they're teaching computer engineering classes based on an academic you know, experience that's so dated. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's a pretty big problem. Uh, I know um, the accrediting commission that we use for the school is the uh, accrediting commission for career schools and colleges. Um, they actually require four years of industry of practical industry experience in your field to become a teacher. It's not just you can't go through academics and then jump right into teaching. You have to have some sort of hands-on experience before um, starting to teach here too. Because that's a, that's a huge problem, especially like. I work in the mobile development industry. That's that's always been my thing. Um, I wanted to make games, but when I graduated, game companies were laying people off. So um, Android had just come out a couple months prior. So I jumped into Android, and I started learning that. And that's what I've done since I've graduated. And that changes every three to six months. It completely changes. So like, if I took what I learned, I graduated 2009. If I took what I learned in 2009 and applied it to today, everybody would be building for an Android platform that is no longer supported and hasn't been for about four years now. So uh, I think it's got... Exactly. It has a less than 0.01% market share. So 
it's not going, I'm not going to teach anybody anything that's relevant if that's the only experience that I had. So um, I, I also like, I mean, I don't know how it is in most other fields. I mean, uh, some industries, like we do have recording arts programs and film programs that uh, the industry changes quite often, but it doesn't change in a major way more than, like it doesn't change as fast as so maybe every couple of years um, with new camera technologies, like 4K just came out. So think of how long 1080p was a standard uh, video format for a long time, and now 4K is just coming out. There's a good four or five year period where you don't have to update any of your camera tech classes or anything. So I, I'm in a situation where Android always comes out with something new every three to six months. We have to always keep things up to date, learn new things. So it's one of those things we always stay up to date. Um, and just by having that hands-on approach, it helps us stay up to date all the time. All of our instructors have to keep up to date the same way that all of our students do. So, so let's does um. Let me ask you this, because I, I know in, in my world, um, especially in the you know the, the federal sector right now, with budgets yeah. being so horrible, um, you know, the ability to keep up is is a financial, you know, pr is a, it really comes down to financial, right? It's yeah, it's always a financial limitation because you have engineers that you're paying that you need you need them to work on something that. To keep up to date on a lot of these new things, you get to actually give them some time to actually take a moment, read up on new documentation, try out a couple new projects, learn how things work. You don't always get the time for it because everybody has to be paid to do something, and if you're right. going to be paying somebody money and you don't have a lot of it, that person's going to have to be working on actual projects that make money. So, what about like so you know these beautiful photos of the campus and all the in the classrooms and it looks like labs and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Does full sale invest in keeping those up to date as well? well yes, we we actually uh, they're renovating a couple new spaces right now. Um, I know when I came to school here, we had um, one of the game dev labs that we had was a room full of the at the time, what was state-of-the-art, like, Alienware computers that were um, hardcore gaming rigs because it was a class where we did a lot of... Um, it was our one class, because we're mostly programmers. We have uh, computer animation programs here that do more of the graphic side of things, but uh, they, they had a class where we get to learn about graphics and actually integrate with graphical editors, and so we had the most up-to-date, top-of-the-line like, gaming computers because they were also the best for rendering because they had some of the best graphic cards and everything, and... When I graduated, when I started, they were really great, and then the way computers were running at the time, like every year, they got infinitely better. Um, by the time I graduated, the lab had been replaced, and then when I came back to work here about a year and a half ago, the lab was completely different yet again. So, um, it's and that, and we all run Apple hardware, so most most of our students run Apple hardware, uh, ma mainly in our degree because we do iOS development. You need to have an Apple computer, but um. Uh, we actually just all upgraded to the Retina MacBooks because that's what the newest standard is. That's what Apple says. This is our new development machine. This is our new machine. We're not even going to make the non-Retinas anymore. So we, everybody's, we're in the process now of updating the Retinas. Our department's done it. A couple other ones are working on it. So, um, yeah, we have to stay up to date because if we don't graduate students who are up to date, then nobody's going to want to hire them, and nobody wants to hire our graduate students aren't going to want to come here. So That's right. It becomes a circle. It's a, it's a giant circle. So it all, keep, it all spawns from us having to stay up to date all the time. So. so let's talk a little bit about what you actually do day to day. So you are, you know, a professor. Uh, you, you're talking about your, your focus now on mobile development, but you showed me earlier before we started some of your students were working like – you know some Arduino projects, I guess, mm -hmm. that would interface through a, like an uh, an Android or an iOS app. So, what does Mike Seely do day to day to help Full Sail University fulfill their mission and not go down that spiral downward to hell and back? Yeah, well, um, we have it. We have a, I have it pretty easy um, most months. I mean, I do have occasional months where I'm swamped. I'm, I'm I'm working under the gun this month because I'm I'm in the con actually in the process of writing new content uh, to update for some new stuff that came out in the latest version of Android, um, and then Android Studio, which is the development environment for Android, has just got updated to Android 1.1, um, and the Android Developer Channel is putting out a whole new vi video series on um, their introduction to Android Studio, and I, I had been using it for since it came, I started using it when it came, hit uh, version 0.9 because I was an Eclipse guy. I was kind of well entrenched, so I didn't want to switch. I was kind of hoping they'd support both. They didn't. So um, 
they started coming out. I started with 09, and I just watched this video last night. I mean, I've been using this for five months now, and I learned something from their video last night, so now I'm in the process of adding this into, like, uh, the Dev Byte series into the class, um, the information into some of our course materials, and relaunching that next month. But um, when I'm not swamped in writing a uh, new curriculum all the time, um, I, I work on projects. I, I still take on um, side projects from clients, um, not nearly as many as I used to when I had, when I needed to. When I, when I was between jobs, I, worked, I took on a lot of clients just because that's what I needed to do. But um, I take on occasional ones now. I kind of work on projects that I find are interesting, um, clients who want to work with the most up-to-date stuff because most of your clients are going to want to work with whatever has the largest market share. Right. So in, in, the mobile, in the mobile world, if you're on Apple, the largest market share is usually the most up-to-date uh, OS, where on Android, it might be the year-old OS is the biggest market share. But if I teach like my students something that's a year old and they graduate a year and a half from now, what they're learning is no longer useful. So I always try to find clients that want to work with um, the latest versions of Android, people who are more forward-thinking who know that in the next six months it's going to be the largest version. They just have to you know, trust that it's going to be the next big thing. So um, so I try and take on some clients. Um, but most of the time I, I spend, I answer... Uh, questions from students. A uh, couple days a week, I, I spend grading because uh, we do mostly weekly turn-ins for our, our assignments um, for larger projects. So, a couple days a week, I'm grading. Most of the time, I'm helping students, and then three days a week, I actually lecture here on campus. So, okay, so that's a, another question. Um, is this a? Can you do this online, or do you have to come to full sale, or is uh, it some we do combination? Both. Okay, we do both. Um, our campus program does have a couple online classes that you take while you're on campus, um, but you usually have a campus class that goes with it, so you'll show up for the campus for one and then have another one that's online. Sometimes you'll have one campus class and nothing else. One time you just have just you have two campus classes. That's, that's usually kind of rough, but uh, our students deal with it quite well. Um, <laughs> uh, we also have a, an online program. Um, the online program moves at a little bit slower pace. We do 32 months instead of 21 months. You do one class at a time. Um, that's just because we realize that you know people who are taking it online have you know jobs and families and a life, so uh, they can't always devote all their attention to two classes. So we do one class a month, and uh, same coursework as we do on campus is online. Um, same content. It's just we move at a little bit slower pace for online students. But we have a a version of both, so we can do it all online. You do it all on campus. We also have a hybrid program where you can. Um, start online, then move to campus, or start on campus and move to online. So, cool. So, day and day. So you're you're lecturing. You're you have assignments. They turn them in. You grade them. You go through them. Um, is the so is it more project based? Is is the the grading more? Are there I guess let me put another way to put this? Is there quizzes, homeworks, tests, or is it more just here's a project that will help? You know, you'll learn some skills that will be applicable to, you know, what you do in the real world eventually. Uh, everybody does their class a little different. I mean, we're one of the few schools that allows like a little bit more freedom for the instructor. So, whereas some schools you'll show up, especially if you're like you're if you're an adjunct, you'll show up, you'll be given some curriculum and be told this is what you teach, these are the assignments, this is how you grade them. Um, we our instructors are allowed to set up their class however they want. Like they have certain objectives that need to be met, uh, learning outcomes that need to be met for the class, but otherwise the curriculum can be structured in different ways. Um, for my class personally, um, I set things up a little differently between online and campus. It's the same content, just different assignments, so more of our campus students would do um, longer weekly assignments so that they can work at their own pace and turn them in when they're done so that they don't have to do things every single day. They could you know, maybe one day they can work for 10 hours on this classwork, maybe the next day they can only work two. So if I had daily assignments, then they do really well one day and then maybe really poorly the next. So um, online we do more weekly projects, and they're complete projects. They're, uh, the first one I have in my class is it's a media player. It uses service and notifications. It uses the Android media playback classes. It's a fully functioning media player that you could give to anybody and they could play the music on their phone with. Um, for our campus students, we do I do things a little bit differently. I do, instead of four weekly projects, one for each week, we do 
two week-long projects that are given as homework throughout the class. And then each day they come to class, we do four hours of lecture and then four hours of lab, um, which it's it, after a while you run out of <laughs> to talk about. That's, you, you stop, hearing, you stop uh, wanting to hear yourself speak after four hours. So that's pretty hardcore, but, uh, man. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, we, we put, we get, the students get it rough down here, but it's, it's like I said, we immerse them in what they're doing. So, um, the four hours of lab works out really well, though, because that's four hours where they're in a classroom, minimal distractions, and I can give them a full project to work on every single day. So, the projects are obviously much smaller in scope than I would give for a week long assignment, but right. each one is a very specific project. It has one main function to it uses whatever materials they learn for the day, and they do the project, and at the end of lab, they would turn it in, or if they didn't quite finish it, they can take it home, and I think um, the way our platform is set up for submissions, they have until midnight that night to get it turned in. Um, and then I also do, it's a quick quiz every single day, just on previous day's material, just kind of, hey, just remember we did this last time, they're weighted really low, it's just a way to kind of get people to not forget everything they learned two days ago because otherwise people will start brain dumping like, all right, I learned this this day, but now I have another project I have to do, so I'm going to learn the next thing the next day. So kind of a way to get them to retain things between classes. So so it seems like, you know, in the, again, going back to the quote-unquote traditional, like the, I guess we have old media, we have old education now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the academic obviously is a, is a lot less um, intense. You know, maybe you're lucky to have maybe one or two one-hour lectures a week. Um, some classes less than that even. Um, and it's you know, again, it's it's more it's very academic. And the way you're expected to offset the you know the the, the or I guess gain additional experiences to go out and get internships um, while you're in school or during your summer break or whatever. But it sounds like you guys, because the workload is, um, uh, I would say, a little bit more intense. And you're 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 lecturing and you're in lab longer. Um, it sounds like that that you know, that is the real world experience that you're getting. Do you know if do any of your students though, or are there any of them really crazy that like even on top of doing all this work they still do you know something else on the side? Because you're down in Orlando, and I'm assuming yeah. you know there's lots of opportunities. Yeah, Orlando is actually trying to become. A like a new tech hub for the country. Um, some of the com companies down here, um, like EA Tiburon, is down here. They make all of your Madden sports games. Um, there's Echo Interactive Group, which is a mobile development company that's located downtown. They just opened up their were a partner in opening up a co-working space uh, called Canvas downtown. Um, they're actually trying to start a technology conference down here, the Orlando, I think it's the Orlando X conference, or Orlando XI conference. I don't remember the name of it. They've been talking about it for a while now. I haven't, haven't had the opportunity to read too much on it, though. Um, so th there are a lot of technology companies down here, a lot of tech jobs. Uh, the simulation industry is huge down here, so people who ever want to, even want to move from mobile to get into simulation. Um, we also have simulation degrees on campus. We partner with a lot of those companies. Um, However, I don't know of many of my students that have jobs or internships at those, just because, um, one, they're in class 40 hours a week. Right. It's already a job, basically. It's already a job, and I do give them homework on top of that. So they're in class for 40 hours a week, and they still have things to do after they get out of class. Um, and that, in addition to the school running, you know, 12 months out of the year, we also run 24 hours a day. So we have classes that run 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m., 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. Oh, uh, that's so awesome. <laughs> and then, like, some of our film programs are recording programs. Like, the film students that want, need to shoot at night, right. um, we actually have a, stu a full studio back lot where they can shoot uh, a couple, I think it's, like, five different um, film settings. But if they need access to one of them on a night shift, then they might even have class at 1 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, it's just it's we run 24 hours a day. The school is always open. Uh, we use a badge system, as you would see in most companies, to get in and out. So it's it's pretty intense. So I mean, and their schedule changes every month. Like my class this month is nine to five. Uh, last month my class was five p.m. to one a.m. So it, it's not <laughs> not really conducive to having a job because you don't know when you're gonna. Right. Yeah. Class and, when and like, I don't know when I'm going to be in class next month until the schedule for next month gets finalized. So, on Monday I'll have class. I, I assume either Monday or Tuesday, 
and as soon as the schedule comes out, I'll know and then can plan for my next month. So, pretty pretty awesome. intense. That is that it, it just uh, it, it's so different than the traditional academic, and I love it. Yeah, it's it, 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 it seems it's practical and it seems like it works. Yeah, I mean you're always working, but surprisingly, like having been a student here, like I'm okay with saying it because I mean, most of my students are pretty swamped in work right now, but. Uh, like you still find time in all of that to work on side projects. Like you don't necessarily have the time to, you know, go out and find a job and work a steady job just because the hours are being crazy. But the way you work, I mean, you take this isn't a you pick your classes you want to take either. It's this is the 21 months. Here's your schedule. This is the classes you're going to go to. Whoever's in that first class with you, assuming everybody passes and moves on, you're in that same cohort from day one of school till the day you graduate. Oh, that's so, cool too. You you know you build friendships in those classes. You find people who have similar interests. Most of the people have similar interests because you're all in the same degree program, and you work on projects on the side. So, what's the average cohort class size? Um, it's very different based off of the different degree programs. Okay. Um, what do you in your in your in your case? Um, in our case right now, our campus program is usually I believe we're running somewhere around like ten to fifteen students in a cohort. Um, some of our larger programs start with larger classes, much larger classes, and then they'll split them into separate groups at different time slots to okay. kind of account for that. Um, ours is also, we do staggered starts right now, so we unofficially start classes every other month. Um, we're, we do technically start every month, but we kind of group our students around so that our cohorts get a little bit bigger if they get too small. So we don't we don't ever want to send a student through and, a cohort of one, like if it's a, if it's a slow enrollment month, or just the same. We don't we wouldn't want to start somebody in a cohort of like thirty people. We want to try and hit that you know the nice uh, student to, student to teacher ratio, so that you don't have one uh, instructor being overwhelmed, or students who aren't getting their questions answered, and then you also don't want to have that awkward one on one situation where right. you're standing up lecturing to one person, because. Uh, I'd sign uh, up for that. I, I enjoy that. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Uh, actually, I, ha I had a, an interesting situation come up where, um, because our, because we do have classes in December, but it's because it's crammed between two holidays. Um, instead of our normal, like some our classes would either run like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, we were running like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we were trying to cram extra days in to, so you still get the same amount of class time in the more compressed schedule between the holidays. So uh, most people try and take off the month of December just because it's a compressed month. And they don't want to sure. kill themselves with work in the shorter period of time. So I had just the right number of like students withdrawing for a month or taking a month off and other people just moving ahead a little bit faster. And then I ended up, uh, I think it was last month, with a, with a one person cohort. Uh, that he jo he rejoined another cohort, so he's got more students in his class this month. But last month it was it was just me and him. So, how's it going, buddy? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, application process is it? Um, want you online download an application, or do you fill out online, or is it a traditional kind of application process, or do you have to provide like some sort of um, portfolio showing prior work? How does that work? Um. We have a we have a an online application um, that you can fill out, and then once it's received here, we'll have we have a team of enrollment guides who actually reach out to you and you know see what your interest is, you know, uh, like you know, beyond the things of you know when would you like to start because um, maybe that is important. We we do want students to come here, but at the same time we also want to make sure that they get to the right program. Like a lot of students will um, sign up for one program. Thinking that thinking it's going to be X, but it's not, and so with our enrollment guides, we'll talk them through. You know, this what are you actually interested in? You know, what what do you like to do? And then they'll try and steer them to the right program. So, um, like commonly, we have we have two programs here. One's the recording arts program, and we also have a mu music production program. So, which sound pretty similar, but the recording arts program focuses more on the technical engineering side, working consoles, mixing music, whereas the music production side is more of a composition degree. So there look at some students that come here that they want to work on the they work on want to work on the consoles, but they like the sound of music production, so they want to go to the music production degree. But then our, that's what our enrollment guides are here for to find out, 
you know, they actually want to work the console. This is the degree that would probably be a better fit for you. This is where you could be more successful. So after applying an enrollment guide, I would usually reach out to you. Um, they're, they're really good with the, the one-on-one interaction. Then they also work you through um, any scholarships that we're offering at the time because we offer different scholarships at different times of the year. Um, and then they'll also try and work you through um, filling out your FAFSA and enrollment process and financial aid and everything. Cool. So uh, that's another. So it all you can go through the normal federal student aid and help. Yep. Awesome. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I'm going down my list here of other <laughs> questions. So, professor extraordinaire. Um, you also love. You said you love. You know, and who? What? You know, dude doesn't live playing lots of video games. Yeah, video, video games, games all the times. Um. What other hobbies or other things, and you can't answer with sleep. You've already told me that one, too. Oh, man. Um, what, is it, what else do you do to help, you know, and is it something that you do that directly, um, you know, reinforces what you do as a, as a day job or as a consultant, or is there other, other, other weird hobbies you do that just are for you are fun, exciting I have lots of little hobbies. Most of them I don't, even, I don't get a chance to do as often anymore. Uh, the one that I, I, I like to do all the time, and my wife tells me all the time this isn't a hobby, it's actually work. Um, I, I program a lot in my spare time. Um, so I don't make games for a living, but games have always been that thing that I like to do. So um, in addition to playing them all the time, which uh, like I, told, I, was, I was telling you earlier, I play, I've been playing a lot of Destiny lately um, to the point where my wife is kind of getting mad at me for playing too much Destiny. Uh, <laughs> I also try. I play around with the the Unity game engine and I start making games. Um, before I got into Unity, I did some XNA stuff before Microsoft killed it off. I uh, just made a couple XNA games for like Windows Phone and uh, the Xbox Live Indie Games channel. Just things that would that I enjoyed doing. It was always it, it's a an opportunity for me to work on something that I don't typically work on every day. Um, it's a way to kind of challenge myself with just learning how to do something new, learn how to program something a different way. Like, uh, and also kind of like learning about games kind of ruined games for me because now I'll play a game right. and then immediately try and figure out how they did that or figure out how they did that and then just try and replicate it. So I'll play a game, find something that's pretty cool, and then try to replicate it myself. Um, the most recent one that I tried to do was actually... Uh, there's a, a fight in Destiny where um, you start to go blind and they get like this black uh, sludge thing coming in from the screen till it's and it starts like getting the lines between the sludge like it's tripping in and then just finally till you go completely blind and you can't see anything. So I tried to replicate a shader on how to do that. Um, didn't make it work right. It, it, mine's just more of a black circle that closes in. Uh, <laughs> still working on that one, but I just I play around with things like that. Um, I started toying around with Arduino just because I've always been a software guy that I've been kind of interested in how to integrate software and hardware a little bit more. Um, I think the the first project I was going to try and work on that I haven't actually got around to doing yet, um, I went through all the starter projects with the Arduino Uno board um, because they came with the whole starter kit from the Arduino website. I was trying to make like an automatic dog food dispenser for my dog so I'd have to, so I don't have to like listen for him to whine in my face. To, that he wants food, and then I can go feed him. I could just like press a button, and it would go feed him, or it would feed him on a timer. Um, never got around to working on that one. I got I got some pieces for it, and I got my my Uno board, and I got everything that I needed to build it, and I just haven't actually built it yet. So, um, played around with that. What else do I do? Um, I play Warhammer sometimes. Uh, the Warhammer the miniatures game. So putting together miniatures and painting those. Not really a technical thing, but it's 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 a, a very soothing hobby for me because I, I don't have to think as much. I just know right. that I have to very carefully shave down this guy's arm and then so it fits into its socket and then glue it so that it doesn't squish together and spew glue everywhere. And it's it's a soothing hobby. For right, because every now and then you got to get your eyes off of pixels, you know? Yeah, exactly. Some people, you'll go blind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I I like things that make me think. And then things that don't make me think. So, like, I, all my, most of my programming is me thinking really hard all day trying to figure out how to solve something. And then once I do, I don't ever want to think for the next couple of days. Um, 
so I'll do something like that. Um, I'll go back to playing video games again. Uh, man, what, what, what else do I really do? That's a, yeah, it's a lot, you know, because, I mean, especially with the amount of commitment to, to, to do, because teaching in general, to, the commitment that it takes to be a professor or teacher is huge, in my opinion. Yeah. You do it right, you know. Yeah, that, that that's that's the caveat there to do to do it right. Um, it's one of those jobs where like it's full of problems and none of them are ever solved, because as soon as you think you've solved them, you have a new group of students come through that are completely different. So you have a whole new set of problems that need to be solved. So it's one of those jobs where nothing's ever truly fixed. So it's like a scout troop. It's like a scout you troop. Once you get yeah. the scout troop running the way you want it, you get the new guys to bridge over, and it all goes to hell again. Yeah, exactly. Which actually, I, I need to. I need to find. Uh, we have one of our outreach guys. I gotta go find and talk to him because uh, I had classes past Saturday and came in, and then there was a uh, a scout leader, one of the, one of the green patches, the right. uh, one of the uh, district guys, who was actually here um, from the Central Florida Council, and I didn't get a chance to talk to him at the time. Then I came back in a few hours later to go like turn my key in for my classroom. And there was like three or four scouts here, so we were doing some kind of outreach program for scouts over the weekend. And I got to find out more about that because I haven't been in scouting for uh, since 2005, so it's been a while. Yeah, I know because I um I tried to get involved with our council down here a couple years back, but timing and other issues just didn't work out. But my um my father-in-law is still pretty big in scouts over the eastern shore, so he keeps me in the in the loop on what's happening and like you know. There's a scouting is finally getting with the 21st century. Like, they actually killed the computer merit badge and they replaced it with like digital technology. Uh, yeah, and and I, some I saw of the some of their merit badge changes and they looked pretty cool. It looked like they were actually like updating. I was like, wow, that's that's shocking. I didn't. I didn't I mean, <laughs> you think, wait, this is like a really conservative group. They're gonna do, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna have the picture of the Commodore 64 in our merit that's badge be book your merit badge, forever. Yeah. I almost bought a Commodore 64 the other day. I actually went to a, a flea market. Um, there was a little street fair they had going on down here, and somebody had, like, an old vintage little shop, and it had, like, old board games, like the like, the original Game of Life, and he had a Commodore 64 in the box. And I almost got it. It was, like, 20 bucks. I just couldn't bring myself to spend 20 bucks on something I would never use. So God, yes. it, would sit, it would sit on my desk and probably hold my monitor. So... <laughs> it could be. I mean, it could be an investment, though, too. I mean, one day that, that if it's a Commodore sixty four in the box, I mean, that's like how many kids was that? Like the first computer? That, that was. It was actually not my first computer. It was actually like my third computer because I actually went like I, I, we jumped around a little bit. Like we had, uh, it was an IBM Laser. It had like twenty meg a twenty meg hard drive in it. You know, it needs more. A five and a, twenty megabytes. A, fi a five and a quarter floppy drive on it, and that was great. And then we upgraded to one that had like a one gigabyte hard drive. The thing was like a small fortune to get that thing. And then that got put down in like the parents' computer room, so kids couldn't touch that one. That was right. expensive. And then uh, my grandmother actually gave me a Commodore sixty four that um, the school she had worked for gave to her that. They didn't have a use for it anymore, so I got a Commodore 64. It was actually like my third computer, and it was a huge step back. Right. But I had so she had so many games on it that on like the big five and a quarter floppies. I was like, oh, I'll sit here and play games all the time. So it became like a game console. It was like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Commodore 64, and then the N64. So I went back a couple of generations before I continued to go forward again. Sweet. Oh. It was great. Tink Tonk and Buddy Bot Land. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember. I don't know what it was. My dad was working on something. And I was sitting down with him, and I just saw the big shiny red light on the power strip. Mm -hmm. and he was working on doing something, and I just remember went, Dink! and all whatever he was programming in Basic it was like <laughs> gone, gone. Nothing saves or recovers. Right. What would you need that for? <laughs> <laughs> into the ether. Yeah, my cat does that to me. Yeah, yeah. Like when I wait till I'm playing video games and just walk over and she'll step on the power strip. Strip, go. You know, don't need that. <laughs> Time to feed me. Come exactly. On. Um, 
so I try to keep these to around about an hour. And okay. Also, you want to get home and all that. So to kind of wrap this up, um, I guess two things. Um, other than the fact that, yes, mobile gaming software development is just in a constant state of flux because we're always adding with new whiz-bang things to take advantage of new hardware or, you know, there's these, you know, people want to go, you know, Google introduces a new concept. Um, so from your point of view, though, in the edu as an educator and someone who does this as a, pro you know, professionally and on the side, mobile development, what do you see, you know, the next five years, which I know is, like, impossible to predict... <laughs> Um, is there anything that you see that, you know, this kind of like, and here's the things I'm thinking of, like, do you think, like, wearables is really going to catch on? Um, you know, like, the, the Apple Watch, the, 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 um, the Android, um... Android Wear, yeah. What kind of things do you think that you're going to have to be teaching in five years that you're not teaching today? If you had to, if you had a crystal ball and you could pretend like you could guess, <laughs> what would you think? Uh, I, I honestly think the wearables thing is going to take off. Um... Everybody's starting to get into it a little bit more. I mean, Apple's Apple's finally going to make it cool. I think that's what's, what it's actually going to take because, I mean, you look at the smartphone. I mean, BlackBerry tried really hard with a smartphone, the Windows Mobile, and then uh, Apple came out with their phone and made it cool. And everybody tried tablet computers, and uh, putting Windows 7 on a tablet didn't work out really well, but people still tried to do it all the time, and or they tried to make gigantic Android phones and call them tablets. And then Apple put out the iPad, and it was cool. So, Unfortunately, Android, it's better for worse, depending on how you like it. Yeah, so it's like Android comes out and says, you know, this thing is going to be great. It's going to be the future. We got Android Wear. Um, my boss really loves He's got an LG, or not LG, uh, the Moto 360 uh, Android Wear device. And he loves it. Um, he actually uses it quite a bit, surprisingly, uh, because he also had a Google Glass that uh, used that quite a bit. And then I haven't seen it in almost six, seven months now, so he hasn't worn that around as much. Uh, I actually had a Google Glass, and I sold mine because um, I always didn't have a use for it, but now the Apple Watch is going to come out, and Apple's going to tell everybody that they need it, and I think everybody's going to say, yes, Apple, I think we really need that. Take the so, money. But, so I think I think the wearables thing is going to catch on. I mean, th they're still trying to figure out, you know, it's, it's one of those solutions without a problem right now, and I yeah. think the medical industry is really taking to it, um, like a lot of the health tracker stuff that they put in it. Um, my boss, again, actually is the only time he ever talks about his Google Glass now is he's actually working on um, a, a medical application that works with Google Glass, and that's a lot of where this is going. Is It's, it's hands-free stuff that I think it's going to push towards in the medical field. But um, So wearable stuff I think is going to catch on. We're actually already starting to teach some of that here. Um, it's kind of hard without and having a critical mass thing, we can't push it too hard. It's like a lot of people ask us every now and then, you know, why don't you teach Windows Phone? It's like, well, do you have one? No. It's like, well, that's why we're not teaching it, because nobody has one. Um, Sorry. We would love to if. Yeah, we teach mobile development, iOS and Android, you know, the things that have, like, 98% of the market. Um, yeah. But I think, another, I think the next, like, really big thing that they're pushing towards, and um, the media has actually picked up on it a lot the last few weeks, is... Um, Moving into cars, actually, because and you spend a lot of time in your cars and your people are doing uh, their commutes, especially if like you're out in LA and you're stuck in traffic for like 19 hours, uh, which I think is probably a little low end. Yes, well, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, Android Auto is coming out. I mean, they've been teasing it for a while. The first cars that are going to launch with Android Auto are supposed to be out this year. Um, I tried to hold out for one. I just couldn't hold out long enough. I needed a new car. Um, the Apple CarPlay is coming out around the same time. Um, Apple's been hiring a lot of auto industry experts and uh, car and like and like auto engineering ex experts lately. That everybody thinks they're building a car. I don't know that they're going to be building one, but I know that they're definitely working on car technology. I mean, they've shown that they're taking that first step with CarPlay. I think it's going to be one of those things that really starts to take off is seeing more of these mobile platforms in other devices. So yeah, that's like, where. I do you remember a QT? Is that the for like I know in Pyth Python the QT is how I draw my my, yeah. my kind of GUI, right? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a it's a it's a GUI system. Um, I think I think I can't remember the original company that had it, it was like Gator something. Uh, it was bought up by Nokia, which I think it's actually owned by Microsoft now. Which was uh, <laughs> it's funny how the whole 
Yeah, it, it gets passed around. Yeah. But it, it's a GUI library, or it's a GUI system that that's used for lots of different devices. Like uh, Nokia bought them, and they tried to put it on their Symbian phones. So they're, um, I think you could put it on S60 phones, and then like the Symbian Bell phones uh, that were out for about a month before they tanked them. But uh, Mego devices, so the OS that never was, also supported QT. Um, they tried to put it on mobile, but it was actually originally started on like a lot of the interfaces for like smart TVs in your fridge, like all those smart like kitchen appliances are built with QT. Um, so I think it's kind of funny now that all these other OSs like Android and iOS are coming up on mobile devices, but now they're starting to spread into the other devices. Right. Whereas the like, QT took the we're going to be in embedded systems and then push on to mobile, and then Android and iOS right now is starting on mobile, and I think they're going to push out into every other device because. I mean, mainly it's because they want your data. That's how most of those companies make their money. The Internet of Things. Just the Internet of Things. Everything right. will have a chip in it, and it'll be sending it straight to the NSA. I mean, to Google. I mean. Yeah, whatever. I mean, I mean, think. I mean, Google bought up Nest for mm-hmm. um, their connected thermostats and CO2 detectors, and then uh, they led Nest with an acquisition of Dropcam for connected like home security cameras or just connected cameras in general. So I mean. They, they tried back in 2011 with uh, Android at Home that they hyped it up real big at their Google I.O. conference, and then within six months, nobody was talking about it because they, they nobody wanted it at the time. So now it's one of those things that's coming back, and people really like the Nest, and then they really like drop cams, and now they're trying to make that... I think they're going to end up making, making that push again, so Nest and drop cam are probably going to come become Android at Home again. It was, it was the ADK, right? It was an Arduino... Base. But I still have that. That's actually still a thing. Is that still a thing? That is you, still a thing. I actually oh, you're giving me hope. I used that at my last job, actually, um, quite often. Um, no, the ADK is actually just a way for your phone to be put in accessory mode, and then you're in, you have a an Arduino board that's in host mode that it can actually host the phone and use all like the phone sensors and the phone information and the touch input and use it as a display. Um, or you can put your phone in host mode and then the USB accessory in accessory mode and then actually access the device's sensors and then show it on the Android display. So it can go either way. So I actually did a little bit of work with that in my last job. We uh, did some USB byte command stuff and pulling data from USB devices over the uh, the USB connection. So like mass storage devices, like learning how to read mass storage devices without having to mount them. Um, which was kind of entertaining uh, and really terrible to work on for a while because I had no idea what I was doing, but I got it working. You give me hope because I know I, I remember they, it was like what 2012 at the Google I/O was the first time they showed it, and they showed it again in 13. But then I guess like last year or the last two years, mm-hmm. there was no ADK and there was no more updates. I was like, oh man, it's it's dead. It's still there, and it's it just it doesn't get as many big updates anymore because. I mean, it's it's pretty well supported. And it's pretty stable right now, so there's not a whole lot of updates they need to make for it. So it's, it's just, all the up, yeah. all the updates are the piece of hardware that connects to the device that you really need to make updates for. And most of the maker community is doing that. I mean, I see your you got your little green guy back there, the laser pointer guy. Yep, my little guy. He's all set up. He's coming. He's coming here. He's working. yeah. See, so hook that up to your Android phone. Use the ADK, and you can control him and spin him around. Well, and so here's. Don't, don't, don't hate me, right? So I, I use the MIT App Inventor mm. to do my app because I'm not I'm not smart I'm not smart enough. See, look, here's I hear my, that there's a guy who takes on projects that really likes to work on things like this. So just you know, so. I know a guy. <laughs> well, I would I would want to know a guy. See, I what I have to do now. I realize I have to enroll in Full Sail University <laughs> because. It is one of the things that I want to learn, and I, I, I think with the Android Studio becoming like you now, okay, yeah, we're forcing down to this. So I think I may give it another shot with Studio. Mm-hmm. Is that as good? Would you recommend? Is that would that be your recommendation? Oh yeah, I, I, I definitely recommend that anybody starting Android development now would definitely use Android Studio. Um, Eclipse was the dominant player for a long time, but. Um, they actually made it. They, I think they've uh, stopped supporting it. I think they got like one guy named Charlie who sits in a closet who still does the updates for Eclipse because they're really slow and sometimes broken. Um, 
the last update made it so that you actually had to uninstall everything and then reinstall it to update um, because you didn't like sign the package properly. But uh, no, I would definitely use Android Studio for it. It's great. Um, They've got a new dev, like I said before, they have a new DevLite series coming out that talks about how to use it. Um, Lynda.com. Um, have you ever used Lynda.com? I've heard of it, never used it, no. Uh, so it's an online video education site. Um, they do lots of really awesome classes. They have a lot of Android classes. They recently took a bunch of them down because they were just out of date and they've been updating them. Um, they put out new video tutorials for Swift. It's Apple's new programming language, so to do iOS apps. Um, they have, I, I've actually been using it to learn new things in Unity every now and then, which is pretty awesome. I was actually using it yesterday to figure out how to create basic models using Blender so that I could dump some low-poly models into my game. So it's a, it's a great site for learning things like that. That's that's usually where I do all of my own, like, new learning. That's my starting point is Blender's my introduction, and then I branch out into documentation and stuff once I know enough about it to kind of get my feet wet a little bit more. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do right by you. I'm going to try to go back and learn it. My you problem should. is, like, for me is... Most of my project, like, because I'm the, I'm like the mirror to you. I, I'm mostly a hardware guy. Yeah, I, I noticed you are all like almost entirely hardware. And all I want to do is make a real quick GUI, a single screen, so you know, because like you're like, like, I have a little left button, little right button to move the motor left and right, and a little checkbox to turn the motor on and off. And I've got, and I, there's a guy, I forgot his name, wrote some code to do the Bluetooth part. So I sit there and I have my little HCO5 connect to it. Oh, one of them right here. That's all I want to do. That's all. But to me, when I, when I start and I go, I go like manifest.xml and I start freaking out. So oh, the manifest learned, is great. Manifest learned, is like your table of contents. Right? <laughs> I'm a C Man- guy. Nah, your manifest is, it's all XML. XML is easy. Uh, your manifest is just your table of contents. It tells you, you know, what components you have, what permissions you use. It's, it's, don't, don't be scared of the manifest. It's not bad. You know, it's amazing what difference just the five, six years we can make between generations. Exactly, exactly. You enjoy your hardware. I'm going to keep you software for it. That's right. <laughs> it takes both to make the world go round. Exactly. All right, so last thing, let's, to wrap this up, you had to go back, you got the, it's back to the future, you get to go back in time, you get to talk to yourself, or better yet, you go back and you get to talk to me um, <laughs> when I wasn't quite a jerk. And I come, oh, there goes my cat. I knew it. I saw it. I saw was. it. There she was. She waited to the end. What <laughs> advice do you give to the young Mike if I want to get into this world today? What things, what, what things, what things do I need to be doing? And I'm saying, let's assume I'm a, you know, I'm a junior, sophomore, high school. What should I be doing today to prepare myself to be in your shoes in, you know, 10 years? Um, I think I actually did it okay. Um, like that's one of the few things where I'm like, oh yeah, I actually think I did all right in getting to this industry. Like, I haven't taken too many missteps in in programming. So, um, if your school offers a programming class of any sort, I, I think it could be, you know, Visual Basic, which isn't used a whole lot anymore. Um, it's it's still a really good intro programming language, though. Um, anything that you can do. Like right now, like are we going back in time, so it's like the limitations of then, or is it like I'm just going to be no, younger, but let's, today? <laughs> it's a, it's like, like the new Star Trek, where it's not really the new Star Trek. It's a new timeline. It's not really the past. It's really an alternate universe. So like today, there's like, so many more resources today than there are than right. there were then. Like so, what then, would you do to yourself today if your then was now? <laughs> if my then was now. What would I do today? Uh, I would get a lynda.com subscription immediately because there's a giant like wealth of information there. It's probably like the best like hub to start. Um, it covers you can cover graphic things, uh, you can cover animations, you can cover programming, web, mobile, desktop. It's like a matter. It's just what do you want to learn really? Um, if your school offers a programming class, I would definitely take it, even if it's a basic intro one, just to find out if it's for you because it's not for everybody too. Like most like. Programming is not the most glamorous career. Um, most people have like the visions that they get on shows of we're sitting there like intensely typing and staring at a screen. Uh, it's more like staring at a screen and lazily typing, leaning back, wondering why your feet hurt. Um, it's not a bad career. It's just you know it's not for everybody. Sure. Um, 
and it, it requires, you know, like if you like solving problems, like I would find anything that requires solving problems. Um, hell, I went through Boy Scouts, and Boy Scouts had a lot of solving problems in it. And sometimes that whole, you know, being able to logically step through a prog- through a prog- through a problem uh, is what helps you figure out if you're going to be a good programmer or not. So I, I would find anything where you can solve problems. If you find a problem, think of interesting solutions for it. If they have, offer it at least an intro programming class, take it and see if it's for you. I mean, it's like I said, not for everybody. So see if, it, if it's even for you. If it's not for you, go, that's great. You've just saved yourself, you know, 10 years of trying to force yourself down that road. Uh, if it is for you, uh, continue to find other programming classes. Uh, like I said, get a lynda.com subscription. Um, if you don't want to pay for lynda.com subscription, there are lots of great um, engineering and programming channels on YouTube that are free that you can go and find. Um, one that uh, my students actually really like is a guy called Slide Nerds on on YouTube that does lots of Android tutorials. That they, they're, okay. he, he talks really loud and angrily, but it's really, really good information. So you don't get the nice soothing tones of like Simon Allardis, for, who's my favorite narrator on Lynda.com, just because he, he like he's he's British and he's got like that really d- deep soothing voice. Like I, I keep, have him read me bedtime stories, I would fall asleep. <laughs> but uh, it's always better British. If you, you don't want to pay for you know the nice soothing British voice, you can get the guy yelling at you on YouTube for free, but it's still really good information. Um, and just try a lot, try lots of different things out. Uh, Code School online, Teen Tree House. Uh, uh, those, they, they offer programs, video lectures. Some of them are free. Some of them you'd have to pay for. But at least offer introductions that are free that you can do small projects. And uh, they'll actually show you in the video, like, this is how it's supposed to be done. Here's some resources. You know, here's an evaluation tool to determine if you did it right. Lots of free resources out there. And, uh, what's the other really big one right now? Is I think it's uh, oh, Khan Academy, Sal Khan. Um, Khan Academy is real big as well. They offer some really good programming tutorials on there as well. So lots of different tools that are out there that are free that are just amazing that weren't available to me. Like I had to go through, like I had to go through my AP computer science class and I had to go to the community college because there wasn't anything that I could really go to that, I mean, that wasn't even that long ago. That was, right. well, that was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, that wasn't all out there. So take advantage of it. it it's, it's, Kids these days, they don't know how easy they have it. They don't. There's a wealth of resources out there that you could teach yourself the basics of pretty much any kind of programming or any kind of technical thing out there, just the basics of it for free online. Um, oh, my other really big one that I really, really like is Coursera classes because okay. you can get that whole traditional education feel in a free class that you take online that you don't have any obligation that if you get tired halfway through and this just isn't for you, you can completely stop doing it. There are no consequences. Or if you get really hooked and you want to learn more, there are lots more classes on there than they're all free. So um, doing Coursera classes are fantastic. Um, they offer, like I have actually, when I was starting to do the Arduino stuff, they offer an intro to electronics class that explains what all of these little things that I'm plugging into this board are, and that was great because I had no idea what I was doing. So uh, Coursera is really good for that as well. Cool. Good advice. Lots of things, man. There's so much, so much. Just go out and get your hands dirty. (laughs) Just do it. Drink from the fountain of information that is the Internet. Sweet. All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up here because... I'm probably going to have to do math homework here in a minute. <laughs> We're in the long division. you got half an hour. You're good. Using the common core system. Well, it takes me a half hour to get into the zone. I have to go back and try to remember, or not remember, learn how they're teaching kids today to do division, which is like using hieroglyphics, basically. Um, I've seen some of the methods, and they're rather interesting because I looked at it, and I had no idea what they're, what they're writing. Like, I have no idea whatsoever. And then it's explained to me, like, oh, yeah, I do that in my head. And it's like, oh, that's why they teach it that way now. Yeah, All there's some. Right. Um, I, I can see some of that. There, the thing that blows, uh, I don't like is, and it blows my mind. It's like, you know, like you're saying, you do it, you do it a way in your mind, like multiplication, division, whatever. You do it. There's a way that in your mind it works. Mm-hmm. With this Common Core stuff, it's like we wanted to teach you every possible way, so that you know, and it makes sense because everyone does it a little bit differently. The problem is, they ask you to show it like five different ways, and it should be like, no, yeah. just show the way. Pick one of these ways that is most right. comfortable for you and do it that way. And do it. But they force the kids to show it like eight different ways, which, you know, 
yeah. frustrates everybody frustrates involved. Everybody involved. Yeah. Yes. This could be a whole other conversation, That's too. That's going to be a whole other one. So I will end it there. <laughs> um, Michael Seeley, Professor Seeley, Full Sail University, thank you, sir for coming on and sharing your infinite wisdom with everybody. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. Like I said, I've listened before, and it's nice to be a part of it. So, One day I'm going to like get serious about this and actually invest in like decent cameras and stuff, but for now this is just a hobby. It has got me a little bit of notoriety be, and something. If you want to be serious, I, I've got my snowball mic over here. I can use that next time, pick up a little bit better sound. It, you know, you were beautiful, man. You oh, were well, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. As always. So next time I get down to Florida, I gotta come back and see you again. We'll go to um, you gotta give me a tour next time, man. Next oh, time yeah. I, am, I am demanding a tour. Dude, they have uh, riverboat tours around here, like the little tiny like paddle boats. No, I want, the I, want a, I want a full sail university tour, man. You, you can have one of them too. I want one of those. You'll have to come down when we do our behind the scenes tour. We actually have once a month we do a big old uh, behind the scenes tour. Put on a big show. Everybody comes out. We get the tours of campus, uh, workshops for your degree program. You do go hear from the president of the university, uh, and we feed you for the day. It's great. So I will cry. Big shindig. So do it all. Do it once a month. It's great. Oh, I'm there. I just got to now convince the people to send me back down there. <laughs> All well, right. you, you work on that, uh, and I will let you know when the behind-the-scenes stores are, and we'll work one out. We'll figure this out. All right, Mr. Seeley, until next time, thank you very much. And, um, yeah, really, really, really appreciate it. This was awesome. No, it was great. Thank you. All right, take care, man. See you.